No Jumper coolest podcast in the world, and we have the one and only legendary West Coast motherfucking icon MC8 in the buildings today. Yeah. How you doing, man? I'm crazy, man. What's good? I'm feeling great. And I brought my uh, fellow Compton homie, AD, here. AD in the building. Come on, Cal. My, my young loco. Come on, man. You All day. Me? Suicide was cracking. Yeah. Hey, there it is. Um, so you were just telling me, and I find this extremely interesting and flattering, that your your son is a fan of No Jumper and is excited that you're here. Yeah, Karan. What's up, Karan? Karan, I told him I was coming to work. You know, the kids be... When you've been in this game, I guess, for quite a while, you got a teenager, you know, they kind of function on the new cats, you know. Mm -hmm. Listen to AD. Oh, come on. There he is. Know, come on, he's 30. He's old uh, school. <laughs> who else? He, he, he loves Compton TG. Yep, my nigga. Um, you know, he loves NBA Young Boy. He mm -hmm. loves Lil Baby. He loves all the new stuff. So, right. Pops is like, you know, yeah, whatever. But you've you been know. raising him. Like, you you were been a famous rapper since he came out, I'm Righteous. assuming. Righteous. So, what was that? Like, do you remember the moment when he started to realize, like, oh, my dad is a rapper? My dad has respect of all these he thought people? It was, he thought it was weird. Really? You know, as a young kid, five, six, seven years old, uh -huh. we pull up somewhere. Oh, uh, uh, MC8? Oh, man, can I get a picture, man? Oh, respect, and man, you know, you taught me so many. He would be sitting there like, why dudes want to take a picture with you? <laughs> and I'd be like, uh, because uh, he'd be like, that's weird. But as he started growing, he started getting into rap music and understanding the level of, you know, artists and famous and whatever. So he understands it a little bit now, but he's still like, yeah. Your pops, though. You yeah. Know, so the, the but, dad thing's always got to be bigger than the rapper thing, right? As, as, exactly. Right. Max. You try to. I mean, I I put forth the dad thing though on him. You know, schooling. I mean, his sports. He plays football. In Norco High School. Shout out. He's a quarterback. Shout out to Norco in general. That's Shout crazy. Out to Norco um, High School. We used to be out there riding bikes all the time. Oh yeah, they still do. Mm -hmm. um, he. Um, I'm I'm real particular about being involved in his growing up, you know, something that I didn't get, you really? know, growing up in Compton, you know, it's vicious. What's up? Single, single family, you know, home, me, mom, sister, little brother, right. you know, gang infested, whatever. So it's kind of a diff different approach uh -huh. that I take with him growing up. I try to participate in all his activities or just being a part of his life in, in general. So dad comes first before artists. I'm not an artist around him. Right, definitely. No, yeah, because I heard you saying that you missed out on being in uh, one of Kendrick's videos and stuff because you had to do your thing right. as a, a father uh, of the football game and shit, which out, I have a lot of respect for Kendrick. that. And that's yeah. gangster right there. That's I mean, the it, it, no disrespect. I mean, shit, I, I would love to be in the video. <laughs> right. Uh, they wanted me in to be in, uh, I think, the It's All Right video right. when they were in the car and then where Terry Crews was with them or whatever on stage or whatever, whatever they did. Um, but I couldn't make it because I just flew back from out of town for a show and I always generally tell promoters I got to be back first thing smoking right. games is at 10 o'clock in the morning so they wanted me to come get in the video but I had just got back and then my son had a game that morning and I'm the head coach right. so mm. I, I, I couldn't I just looked at it as not trying to renege on my obligations to the kids you right. know you know so it's got to be a battle because AD and I were having a conversation recently. He had uh, one of the what was it one of the teachers told your kid like, oh, oh you know man. your your dad is a gangbanger. Your dad is a crip. The, the after school the after school teachers told my daughter that you know your dad's a crip, right? Mm. She's eleven, right? And then my daughter's like, my dad is not like that. You know what I mean? And I'm like, why would you even sit there? I want to go there and fuck him up, man. Yeah, the, the they they tend to not understand. Uh, uh, I guess they just want to put on the aspect of just the gang aspect, or but they don't know the longevity of what we have been through as far as representing <sighs> or trying to uplift Compton is what I say. Mm. You know, so Facts. you know people kind of get it mis you know misconception about who we are as far as just seeing colors. Mm. So you get people to get that wrong perception. It's interesting though, because you're so far removed from it. Like with AD, you know, there's, there's articles in the news about you getting into some shit from like you know a handful of years ago. But with you, do you feel like you've got that that space between like you really being in the thick of being associated with some shit and where you're at now? Like, and does it still feel like it follows you? To an extent, yeah. Mm. I mean, it always follows you. It, 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 it never lets down because people still associate, you know. 
I still hang with my homies from Trag New. Uh, I, you know, they just at my video. You know, I, I get along with them. You know, so the 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 association always stays with you, so to speak. But it's a different aspect. You know, as being a little older and trying to be in between. You know, because you look at the aspect of wanting to stay connected to the streets, but got an obligation, you know, with family and kids and we're trying to work and get money and you know what I'm saying, we're trying to represent where you from, it sometimes might cause friction with trying to get paid or make money or because we want to stay true to where we're from because that is what basically we build our foundation off of, mm. that struggle right there. So it, it, it it's a give and take for me because being older, I try to show my son that, you know, it's not about certain situations that I've been through or what people see, but still, I still got that connection. Because mm -hmm. like I said, Compton raised me, Compton gave me the foundation, being involved in the gang situation. So, and especially when you go on tour and you go out of town or whatever, and people still living that life like we still live in here. So they want to still connect you to that. So you, it, it's like a 50-50. Mm, definitely, yeah. And, I mean, some people, though, will at some point in their life sort of take on like a different perspective and not want to be even associated with the, their game being passed in any way. I mean, it's kind of like a tricky balance to like show that you respect and appreciate the culture and the history of what you're a part of without – also like somehow glorifying like the negative elements of that which i don't really think should be that controversial like if you're if you're like a diehard soccer fan of a certain soccer team nobody's asking you to denounce the soccer hooliganism of no, the people no, rioting exactly. and beating each other up and stuff you know just because there is a part of crippin that is young guys doing crazy shit gangbanging in general doesn't change the fact that there's a lot of grown adults who are still you know consider themselves associated with it and it's not a negative thing in their life I mean, yeah, I never looked at it as, as as uplifting or trying to promote negativity as far as the gang situation is concerned. Um, being where I am now, I wouldn't trade it for nothing, what mm -hmm. I went through. Straight because up. it gave me a lot of, of who I am as far as seeing what I went through and what I came through. So not to be like, Oh, we want to just glorify it. But it was a stepping stone in my life that made me who I am and enabled me to talk to people like you and give stories and tell about the situations and what was the realness behind gang banging and being from a neighborhood. So I still embrace where I came from and how I grew up mm. because it, 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 it enables me to get him, save my son from certain situations that he's not gonna have to go through what I had to go through. But like I say again, I wouldn't trade that shit for nothing. Mm -hmm. Cause that, that was the life, you know what I'm saying? That was the choices we had. And what I say in one of my songs, it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though people might look at it as a negative, like these were the choices we had. And I chose that route. I don't regret it at all, not mm. one bit. Definitely. Um, so from your perspective, growing mm -hmm. up in Compton and shit, like at what point do you start to figure out about Compton Most Wanted and MCA? Like was, you know, Compton has such a rich history of rap music. Mm -hmm. At what point does it kind of like enter your consciousness as a kid? Hey, so it, you know, it's crazy because I told you earlier, I said me and Ada from around the same way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, growing up, that's all you heard, you know what I'm saying? Like, my pops used to play quick all day. He used to play eight all day, so, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, even like I told bro, I said, man, I, I chill want me to do some shit for him this week, and you exactly. know what I mean? Like, all the, all the niggas that I used to look up to, you feel me, it's just dope to get saluted from them and be like, okay, you doing your thing and shit like that, and, and you fuck with it. But, you know, just like bro said, like, we don't glorify every single thing we did, but we never gonna turn our back on you know what I'm saying, where we came from. Mm. You know, I don't tell my homies to go do nothing bad. I'd be like, hey, look, you want to come out here with me? You want to, you know, live better and shit like that? I want to inspire you to do that because I'm the same nigga that came from the same place you came from. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, it's kind of crazy how, like, rap music still 
offers like you know the the same thing that like your initial impression of it where did, did you see rapping as sort of like your way out of that environment because that's definitely when i talk to him how i mm -hmm. see it having function to him where he very quickly realized like oh there's a big future beyond just what i see on this block or whatever i think um as a kid i had those typical dreams of ooh football player or policeman fireman that type of shit and Growing up in Compton and seeing what was happening around me and being introduced to rap music at a young age with uh, Toddy T, shout out my nigga Toddy T, mm -hmm. uh, Mixmaster Spade and cats like that, uh, it basically gave, it was basically to me a way of expressing what I saw on a daily. Mm. Now, did I think it was going to transform me to star status of whatever? I never looked at it like that. I was just a young motherfucker who wanted to get on tape and talk about track new. Mm. That's what I <laughs> wanted to do as a young kid. Did I think I was going to be riding in limos and rap magazines and shit? Nah, because I was so I was so just all about the neighborhood that my songs and what I first rapped about was nothing but that. Then when I started listening to the radio, hearing cats like Eric B and Rakim, uh, you know, LA Dream Team and, and Curtis Blow, I started going like, wow, motherfuckers making rap money off of this shit. Mm -hmm. And then you get to see in the magazines with the fat gold dookie ropes and the limousine rides and the videos. And then I start going with shit. Maybe I can turn this into from just track new rapping and Compton rapping and Crip rapping and whatever. And maybe I could just start telling stories. And so the quest turned into maybe I could get a record deal. So it started from there with wanting to turn it into professionalism shit and wanting to get videos and all that shit. But at first, I looked at rap just as a form for me to express about where I was from. Right. I remember talking to Too Short and him telling me that he was basically the first rapper to have any kind of real popularity from the West Coast, obviously up north. But was who were you looking at? We love Too Short. Right, but he was talking about how he ha he basically had to look to the East Coast to uh, see I mean, rappers as far making as, it. As far as making it? Yeah. I mean, definitely. Mm. I mean, all I listened to was fucking Kumo D and Sparky D and UTFO, Roxanne Shante. I mean, that was my first introduction to Rio as far as hip hop concern. I mean, because Todd was making tapes spade and them was making tdk tape selling up in the hood but they was telling us about hood life right which was so popular and which was good but when you looked and you listened to the radio and you heard utfo roxanne and you heard sparky d or you heard kumo d or treacherous three or early ll cool j and shit that was like hip-hop music like it was I'm bad this and my chain this and we were, it wasn't about my block, my hood, my mm. spot. So that sort of kind of took me to the form of rap being a career or a job where you can make money from it. So I would listen to, like I said, everything was East Coast rap mm. because our rap at the time outside of the neighborhood rappers our shit was Bobby Jimmy and the fucking critters and fucking, <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, we was the wrecking crew and right. fucking, I mean, early niggas, Tone Loke and Young MC. Our rap wasn't really significant compared to those cats on the East Coast. So that's what I grew up on when rap turned into something real for me. Right. I was all East Coast connected, real, real shit. That's crazy too, because I heard you talking about how like, it just wasn't the norm or it wasn't even like a possibility back in the day for you to really be stating the specifics of what gang you were associated with, what block you were from. Was it was it that the labels wouldn't let you do that or was it more that you thought that the audience wouldn't want to know the specifics of where you were from or would it be able to relate if you were just saying shit that was super specific? I never really... <clears throat> I don't know. I guess I guess for us, labels will pull a plug on you real quick. 
uh, video channels would ban you real quick. Mm. I mean, you get your album stickered up, you know. So there was a certain thing that we couldn't do mm. as far as, like now, as far as representing your neighborhood and claiming where you're from and I'm from so-and-so and I'm from so-and-so. It's more open now because the hip hop, because the business of hip hop is so, let's say, independently owned now. Right. You know, AD can put out his own shit. Mm -hmm. I could put my own shit out and I'll say what the fuck I want. But when I'm signed to Epic and Sony, I can't really go in the studio and say, Trag knew this, Trag knew that, and we did this, and I don't give a fuck about them and woomp de woomp. Because then they looking at it like, how am I supposed to sell this shit? Mm. How I'm supposed to sell this shit when all you're talking about is your street, your block, your color. I mean, it 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 at it, at at a certain part, it was a money making machine, but to an extent because labels were scared. I mean, it was to the point where motherfuckers used to hire security and put them in the lobbies because we were a lot of us were affiliated, mm. being artists. You get me, so. It was a it was a thin line back then with labels, and with with like now you could go to your neighborhood and have your bandana and represent where you're from. I shot if I shot a video like that 20 years ago, nobody would have played that motherfucker. <laughs> nobody. MTV would have been like, "Are you kidding me? We're promoting gang violence, and right. he's openly saying he's a crip from so and so. And look at him; they got throwing up gangs. Man, please, <laughs> it would have never happened. But like I said, hip hop is so independently owned now. Like you can do what the fuck you want to, right. you know, because everyone's doing it now. Everyone's like, I'm from here. I'm from here. Who gives a fuck? I'm representing this. And you have more creative control mm. with your with your own situation. So definitely. And it's kind of crazy to think about because you were like the rare person from that environment who was talented enough, but also was able to work the machine, which is the thing that a lot of younger artists now don't have to do as much. And like was kind of amazing when you look at a lot of earlier artists in the rap game is that they managed to like make the music, but then they also managed to be able to work with the labels and be able to pull it off because a lot of like these younger artists, you know, they're dope, but they are, it's a lot easier for them because the labels are literally hounding them mm -hmm. for to sign to them. Exactly. You know? Back in my days, labels had to go out. You know, A&Rs had to go to showcases and, you know, look for whatever. But now it's about a lot of artists are creating their own hype, their own lane, their own fan base, their own popularity. Mm. So labels just sit back and wait to see who's the next popular Instagram kid nice. or who's got the, a lot of views on YouTube or social media or whatever. And then they go, oh, yeah, man, you see this kid? He's got half a million followers on Instagram and Facebook, and he's got a million views on YouTube. Why not go get a part of that? Right. When I'm having that conversation with young artists, a lot of times it's it's just literally me instructing them on, like, you should get these guys to do your videos. You should get this person to help you out with getting on, you know, getting your Instagram more pop and getting on all the different blogs, different sites and stuff. Because the more you could build your own shit up, then you have more leverage to get more money and more, you know, effort out of the labels. Whereas if you sign super early on, you're basically like you're, you're cutting off your own legs in the sense that you're not going to be able to really develop your career on your own. You're going to basically have to rely on them the whole way. But from your position, you just like to be able to do that legwork on your own was so much more difficult. You had to like work within the system. Like when you Definitely. have a conversation with Too Short, he talks about putting out, you know, an album a year for like 20 years with the, the labels and stuff. And that's kind of the amazing thing is that he was able to stay on good terms and work well with the label for that long. That's kind of like amazing. You know, that's, that's not something that most artists in this day and age are really even mm -hmm. thinking about. Labels back in our days, they looked at artists as let's let's say, like everybody does cash okay and when our type of west coast music started too short cmw nwa q whatever labels wanted that it was the new thing Ooh, hip-hop oh it's taking off whatever mm -hmm. so 
if you sold enough of records and then back then labels sign you to seven, eight year deals, mm. you get mm. me? Nowadays, you know, if a label sign you three records, whatever, whatever. Back in my days, I signed for seven albums with Sony. So as long as you worked, and like you said, you had to work the machine because it was a give and take. Mm. You wanted shit done, they wanted certain shit done. And if you went along with the machine and the way it worked, then your longevity lasts. And that's how it basically, I looked at it. Because a lot of us didn't sell the units that cats are selling today, mm-hmm. you know. Mm, but some of us were able to have that longevity on labels because we got along with the labels. We met that quota, you get me? Mm-hmm. And if you were able to meet that quota, then you got another record next year. Right. If you didn't, you got dropped. That's right. how labels did us back in the days. If you were able to meet that quota, because let's face it, they put their money into the pop artists. And we were the back end of a lot of labels, mm. the hip hop. You know, we were the back end of the Pearl Jams and the Madonnas and the whoever was popular. So if we made that certain quota within that black music department of hip hop, then fuck it, let's give him another record. Oh, he sold 350000 To us, that's whatever, we made our money back and got a little piece. He's not going to make none. He's still in the red, but, you know, so that's how you were able to have your longevity to me as far as I'm concerned, you know. It was just the give and take. You got along and you get along. That's how it was, you know. You ever think about what your career would have been like if you were, you know, a young guy in this day and age like how, how you would go about it or, or how different because it, yeah definitely think about I it mean, a lot? so many man i mean you would do a lot of shit so differently mm. thinking about the units i sold and the connections and whatever there's a lot of shit you would do differently than me going to sign off to a epic records back in my days right. you get me so, because being independent is is first of all is strong for you because you can control your career and like i said you can do what the fuck you want to do as far as you don't have to i had to follow certain criteria Mm. if if music switched you had to switch with it it wasn't uh uh well fuck that i don't give a fuck or now they doing this type of rap fuck that if you didn't go along with the program you got dropped it was just simple being independent, you have so much control mm. over what you want to do. That's why in this day and age, if I was in this arena, it would be a better situation because then you could you can connect to the fans. You can control what you want to do, what you want to see, what you want to eat. You know what I'm saying? As far as trying to follow a pattern of being signed to a major label and being skeptical if they're going to invest enough money into you. You know everything you're putting into your independent project is you. And it's your heart, it's your soul, it's everything that you got to give to it. So fuck whatever. Definitely. Uh, your kid's like super obsessed with the music part of it, but is he enamored with like the street angle or that aspect of it in the same way? Or does he find that as fascinating as I'm sure you did as a kid? I grew up in it. Right. He didn't. Mm. So that's the difference. I try to, I try to preach to him that there are certain things I went through at your age that you don't want to go through, and that's why I'm here. I'm here to save you. Now, a 15, 16-year-old, they're going to do what they, because they think they know everything. At 15, 16, I knew everything. My mom couldn't tell me shit. I don't give a fuck. Right. Same thing with him. I just get a little more respect because I'm there every day with him, and I try to save him for the pitfall. So has he made mistakes? Of course. Kids going to do that. We all make mistakes. But being in the difference of where I came from and how I was grew up and how I was raised as as opposed to where he's growing up Hmm. and the friends that he's around and the people that I know that he associates with, my mama didn't know who the fuck I was hanging with. Hmm. When I walked off the porch and went down (laughs) the block and she was at work, she didn't know. Motherfucker come up to her right now and tell her, your son was down the block with dope and pistols and... Who? My son? (laughs) My son don't gangbang. 
Me right. too. Same thing. My son don't gang bang. Same Into thing. the highest heaven. His mom is mad as hell at him for having an article out that was calling him a crip and shit. She's like, oh, why does that got to be on Google? It, it's crazy because in my grandma's dying day, like, people would tell her, you know, your son, you know, your grandson is, he's down the street with boom. She was like, no, he's not. Mm-hmm. He's, no, he's no, coming he not. over here. Like, my, 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 my son is the, the, the salt of the, he's yeah. the soul, you know, but that's just the way they want to depict their kids. But, I'm on my son. I'm tracking his ass. Where you at? <laughs> you at so and so house? All right, nigga. I'm looking at you right now. On um, play because I don't want him to go through. I was going to jail at 16, right. 17. You get me? Walking around with straps and riding in the back seats of cars with OGs, rolling through enemy neighborhoods and shit. I don't want him to go through that. Yeah. You get me? If I could save face from that shit, then I'm gonna try to do it. It's crazy because when I was a kid, there was just so much shit that my parents didn't know about in terms of my life and what I was interested in or what the temptations were. And it feels like that doesn't exist as much because there's so much information out there that it's like, how could a parent be in the dark about the risk of their kid getting into drugs, Mm -hmm. the risk of their kid getting into crime, getting into (laughs) God knows what? It's all out there. There's a fucking 100,000 articles written about everything that's risky that that the kid might get into. It's very unlikely that you're going to just miss it totally, right? It definitely. You have to pick up on this. Because like I said, they still think they slick. I mean, when <laughs> yep. I grew up, I thought I was slicker than my mom. Is there shit that she doesn't know about to this day? Probably. Mm-hmm. But there's shit she did know about that I didn't think she knew about. So like I said, they're always going to try to pull it. You know what I'm saying? But right, like you said, there's so much fucking technology and information and shit that you can try to save your kids from. Are they still going to do some shit? Right. Hell fucking yeah. <laughs> We're like, when, when, my, my, my son done did some shit that I done woke up <laughs> in the mornings and I'd be shaking my fucking head. Like, I'd just be like, I don't get it. When? How? Yeah. <laughs> Nigga, I'm like this on your ass. Like, Okay, you say you here? Okay, I'm good. I know where he at. And then, he, and then motherfuckers still call me and be like, you know, uh, Quran, blah, blah. And I'll be like, how? <laughs> right. But they're going to get away with some shit. You just have to be like, you just have to utilize what you have. That's what I say. You right. know what I'm saying? So I track him. I try to know who he hangs out with, where, what he's doing, his activities, you know. My mom didn't do all that. Not to say that she wasn't, but it wasn't as much as, you know. It wasn't even possible. She right. go to work, I'm gone. Yeah. I'm, on, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking five neighborhoods over, right. you get me? She doesn't know. And then sometimes we had snitches who would tell. Yeah, oh yeah. I saw your son ditching this morning. He snuck back through the back fence and was in the house with a girl and blah, blah. So it was certain shit I got away with and it was certain shit I didn't. But I think now that... It, 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 the U for access it, it's accessible to a lot, but then like it, it, it's a catch twenty two because they are accessible to a lot. Mm. You get me, right? That same so, information that you're using to be able to know what's going on in your kid's life, they know what's they going got on. that access exactly. to everybody else in the fucking world. Yeah. So they gonna try to outslick you. Mm. You get me because they got the same information too. Facts. Hey, I was gonna say, funny as shit though, because uh, coming where we come from. Our school, with high schools you go to, determines, you know what I'm saying? You don't yeah, go to this high yeah. school. So the funniest thing is that my mom told me, you got to go to summer school, and the only one you can go to is Centennial. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll tell my mm-hmm. mom, like, Mom, I can't go to Centennial. Exactly. Yeah. And she's like, why can't you go to this school? Yeah, they don't get that. No, they don't mm-hmm. get that. That's like in my days, Mom tried to check me in the Chester Adult no, School. No, can't do that. I'm like, I <laughs> and, and she's walking me through the halls. And it's already dudes like they lined up my first day same they thing. lined up like really like really you finna check in here and i'm like she don't know shit right like boy i don't give a damn you got to go here and i'm going <laughs> like <laughs> what can i come up with to let this woman know I will not make it the first fucking day here right. without fighting about 50 niggas. Uh-huh. Like, like, but they don't get it. 
Like, I can't tell her, oh, yeah, I'm banging from mm-hmm. the neighborhood across the street, and this is the enemy neighborhood, and all these dudes you see in here knows we associated with the motherfucking neighborhood across the street. And if I go here, I might not be around in six <laughs> in, in, in six weeks. Right. And, Mom, you're going to feel pretty bad if that happens. But you can't tell her that uh-uh. because she a woman from the South. They come from different times and different and gang banging in colors boy please i slapped the shit out of one of these motherfucking niggas yep. talking about some gang banging and shit right you finna get checked in this they don't understand so it's different times and shit if my son told me some shit like that right i'd be like oh hell yeah you can't go to this motherfucker <laughs> right. no way but it was different times for them then like i said the kids how we have a lot of we have a lot of knowledge of what's going on as parents than our parents did. And that enables me to be able to school his ass a little better than I was schooled in the predicament I was. My parents didn't come from gang banging and living in neighborhoods like that. My parents came from Gulfport, Mississippi, you know, back in the 40s. Get, what the fuck is a gangbang? <laughs> right. You get me? My mom's migrated, pops migrated to California, and then had me in the 70s, and next thing you know, niggas is banging. Mm. But, so, but they don't, you know what I'm saying? What the fuck is that? But I have to live that now. You get me? So I have to maneuver through that. And me being able to go through that enables me to have children and go, okay, I can't let my kids be subject to that because mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, they're going to be subject to that. Right. To result of our younger generation banging and that aspect because you ju- you grow up into what you live, right. period. Do you ever think about how crazy it is that like L.A. gang banging has basically been exported all over the country and the world to, to the point where, like, it doesn't even surprise me at all when there's rappers from down south talking about their Grape Street Crips, whatever. That don't even register in my brain <laughs> as out shit, of the ordinary at this point. Our shit is popular. Yeah. You get me? Not, not to glorify our shit, but our shit is popular, eh? You get me? Come on, man. They love our shit. <laughs> hey, niggas tag not, in. Not to, not to be, like, let me go again. Not to glorify or make people believe that our situation that we we that was our choice of our situation our the product of our environment you get me had i grew up in cerritos been perfect i've been a doctor. i probably wouldn't be here with you today mm. had i grew up in cerritos had i grew up in fucking lakewood come on <laughs> it goes down to the lakewood mall it, it, yeah, it, 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 because, because, always hey, trending on Twitter and shit. <laughs> because that's right, our right. that's our motherfucking <laughs> yeah. that's our that that's, was our mall back then. That's our mall. Right. The Compton had to swap me, and right. when they took that away from, but we been going to Lakewood Mall getting busy mm-hmm. because that, that that was just the spot. We ain't going to Cerritos. Hell Fuck no, that. they ain't right. letting us either. But Lakewood, that's right outside of Compton. It, it's just because niggas don't like to drive too far nowhere either. South so Bay that Gallery. was good enough for us to be able to, yeah, Lakewood. But we had, like I said, different products, different environments is what we had to go through. And like I said, we don't glorify it. It's loved everywhere now. Mm. You get me? It's worldwide. Go to Japan. Motherfucker, I done been to Germany, France. I done been everywhere. Mm. Niggas is bandanas and some niggas is cripping. Some niggas is blooding. And it's like the motherfucking tidal wave shit effect. It started. I don't give a fuck what nobody say. Cripping and blood started California, West Coast. Okay. And it fluctuated because some niggas either migrated out. Or some people just felt like we gon' this is a way for us to represent. Mm-hmm. Now I've been over in our house. Now I could say now when I was going back to New York in my early rap days, I really didn't see too much of cripping and blood. Mm. I saw clicking and crewing and project niggas and whatever, whatever, and you know, South Bronx niggas and you know, whatever. I didn't see too much of Crippin' in blood. As far as I went down south, as far as my career started going, 
I started seeing more. Mm. I would go to Milwaukee, see Bloods. I would go to Texas, see Crips. I would go to New York, see Crips, Bloods. So n not to try to disre because some niggas have a problem when you try to put the authentic tag on California niggas as being the gangsters. So I don't want to offend any other sets or cliques in any part of the country that might feel that, hey, we are as authentic mm -hmm. as whatever. I just go back to my yesteryears and as far as I've been crawling and walking, gangbanging started in the West. Mm. You know, Compton, LA, Watts, whatever. It migrated because of niggas migrating out or people being fascinated with the style or just niggas feeling like, fuck that. We gonna represent shit too. I've gone to Chicago, you got GDs, you got Vice Lords, you got what, you know, everybody has a different title, but everybody's red or blue. Mm -hmm. So don't wanna glorify it, but it's just something that has turned into a fascination as being niggas who, stand up for each other you get me so that's what i look at it as i've never put it into the aspect of niggas is banging because of a color or whatever it's more it's deeper than that it's yeah. always been deeper than that i just looked at it as niggas you know a lot of us who were lost who didn't have older brothers or family lost or dead it was a way for us to become one and represent our part of where we grew up and protect our home base mm. so that's what i always looked at it as Definitely. Um, do you feel like the, the new generation of fans are, are, are they adequately educated about the history of rap? Do you feel like hip hop as a whole has sort of let down the younger generation? Because, you know, if you look at a lot of forms of music, if you're like a rock fan, it's probably pretty common for you to listen to, you know, the Beatles, or the Rolling Stones, be True. familiar with all this classic stuff. Sometimes it feels like in rap, there's such an obsession with what's new that some of the, you know, and we do see, we see the culture being like celebrated by a lot of institutions and stuff. And when you see something like Straight Outta Compton, the movie and stuff, it, it gives you a lot of hope that like, okay, there are people who care about documenting the history right. of this art form. But do you feel like that's sometimes something that's kind of lost and the, the, the moments, the high points of your career maybe sometimes aren't like, put on display to the same extent that they should be? I feel that as far as that some, some artists of the new generation, because uh, uh, some artists do respect the old ways of the hip hop and respect what was built or put before them and understand about that. Thus you have NWA movies and the younger generation can see where that aspect came from. I feel that some artists in the newer generation don't like to respect the old ways of hip hop because they feel it as competition. Mm. Because I've gotten it from certain new artists. I'll move over, you shouldn't rap no more, you should just let the new niggas handle it. And I always try to put my Percept I always try to put my perspective in street shit. You are older, nigga. 36. <laughs> You've been in your spot since you was 15. Mm -hmm. It's your block. It's your corner. You got your clientele. New dude moves two blocks over. Now, y'all from the same hood. Rap, so to speak but this is the block. So y'all dealing in the same profession. You've had clientele for 20 years. Come to you, always buy your product. Have no problem with it. New cat around the corner got some new product. It's pretty good. Clientele is liking it too. You're not in competition with him. You got your clientele, I'm good. No problem. He, for some reason, don't like that you still can sell to your clientele. He wants your clientele. So he feels you should shut your spot down and tell all your clients that's the new product mm. in the neighborhood. Hey. Don't buy my shit no more. 
go buy his shit. But why? Nobody's complaining about your product. Your clientele for 20 years has no problem with coming to buy your client. And I don't give a fuck about your clientele. You can have yours. I'm not trying to steal them. But why should I tell my niggas to stop buying my shit because you done moved on the block too with the same shit I'm selling? Mm. Would you do that? Would you tell your clientele, no. don't buy from me no more. Fuck it. Go buy his shit. I'm still selling my dope until we run out. Until until <laughs> un, until a motherfucker until, tell, until your motherfucker <laughs> tell you your shit is whack. <laughs> Your, your dope whack, Adam. No, just no. fuck it. This shit's fire. But if, your sh- but if niggas still knocking on your door every time you release new product right. and you still got 100 niggas knocking going, where is it? Mm-hmm. Why the fuck you should you stop? And I think that's what this, they have a problem with, mm. is that when they look down the street, you still got niggas knocking on your door. Mm-hmm. That's competition for the new kid, right? Because I don't want them to even bother with your nigga you so fucking old you so what you 50 now still serving mm. but why are you worried about it my clientele don't even like your shit <laughs> not that it's bad because you got a gang of motherfuckers coming to your door too mm. but leave my leave my clients alone right. stop hating on my fucking shit stop telling motherfuckers oh that nigga old he can't sell he can't rock it up he can't bag it up no more why you telling them that when shit when I tell a nigga, hey, I got new shit, <laughs> they, they still right. lining the fuck up. Because some people might not realize, though, that your shit, when you put it on YouTube, like your videos still have, you know, half a million, million views and stuff. I mean, that's very, very impressive when you consider how long you've been in the game that there's still that many people tuned in. That really says a lot. Leave my product alone. <laughs> <laughs> my shit still selling. Still selling. <laughs> you get me? So, and I'm not even hating on you. Mm. I never I'm not heard it that tell- way either. That's I'm, crazy. Come on. That, that's, you got to put up. it into real street perspectives for niggas who come from the streets because there's a lot of street niggas who doing this rap shit now. Mm. So I put it in that perspective. Now, now put your young self in the old man's shoes when you 10, 15 years from now and you still trying to sell your product. Mm-hmm. Are you going to let that new nigga come in Hell and go, no. stop buying AD's fucking product because I'm no. the new nigga on the block now. AD got good dope. I still like AD shit, nigga. Come on, man. Every time I like... Every- Every time I spark that shit up, it, it's bomb to me. When I put the motherfucking headphones on, I stick that motherfucking shit in my tape deck and I turn it up, mm. it's still feeling good. So why the fuck am I finna stop? Yeah. That's, That's what I don't understand about motherfuckers because if, if, because Ashanti ain't telling motherfucking Patty LaBelle don't make no motherfucking records no more. <laughs> you get me? That's real. That's real. Janae Iko ain't telling motherfucking Mary J. Blige, <laughs> stop buying Mary shit because she old. Right. Only buy my shit. Rap, rap is just like that. I, I just don't get it. Rap is we so all competitive, can eat. you know? But you know a lot of artists don't study mm. and write. They don't have real heroes in rap. I feel like a lot of niggas that get on now, they just, it's so much shit now. Like, you know what I'm saying? Me growing up and getting into music, I had to study and see, and I wanted the respect from niggas like eight. You exactly. tell me to be like, hey, I salute you. And that's why Kendrick will be like, hey, eight. I need eight on this motherfucker. The first nigga that I fucked with was Exhibit. Exhibit, you know, when Exhibit saluted me, I'm like, damn, I'm doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Eight salute me, I'm doing the right thing. You feel me? You bring me in the room with Dr. Dre, I'm like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. The, the foundation for the niggas who started it, where I come from, if they can say you doing it right, I'm doing the right thing. And these niggas is coming up now, they not respecting it. Mm. And they got too many distractions. They got new drugs that's fucking their minds up at the end of the day. And they have all these different, you got Instagram now. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, when I started rapping, social media wasn't even out. You know I, what I'm I, saying? I, I MySpace. 
I want to tell kids sometimes that the best way that you could learn about the world around you is to learn about shit that happened that before, like the moment that you're wrapped up in where everything right now feels very new and very controversial and shit. Like, no, if you go back and look at the history of music, if you were to read about a rapper that you don't even you know, necessarily have a real reason to know about or whatever, you are going to learn the lessons from his life story that are going to be painful and expensive and time consuming for you to learn on your own. Definitely. It's always good to go back and learn from shit before you. Mm. I mean, that's how you learn a lesson. And how you get respect, really, at the end of the day. Like, if you, a lot of times I'm interviewing younger rappers, and their list of rappers that they respect are all people who basically came out within like the last two, three years. You're not gonna have that much of a perspective on how far rap music can go if you're only looking at people that have been, that are popular right now and came out within the last couple years. But see, then too, now for the kids, it's so many rappers now. You know Mm. what I mean? So, you know, you growing up with hip hop and I'm growing up with hip hop, it probably was like 15, 20 t- top rappers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now you got two, three hundred every every week. Somebody dropping 20, 30 songs. So these kids is like, OK, this is instant. This is instant. This is instant. This is instant. You don't really like I remember going to the conference swap meet, picking up a CD, reading mm-hmm. the booklet, listening to only that for a month or two months and reciting mm-hmm. it. And that's what make you. You know what I'm saying? Stay listening to, to to a person and becoming a real fan. And now niggas don't have real fans anymore because this nigga dropped now. They over here now. They like, okay, oh, when he drop again, I'm going to come back over here now. And it's all over the place. They don't understand the level to which our heroes, our heroes, like an 8 or a Snoop or a, a Dre is what it is to us because, like, I might have really listened to Doggy Style like 2,000 times. Exactly. Like, I don't think any kid, no matter how dope your record word is, for it, word. not 2,000 times. You might get the, the Spotify song that is number one on the, the playlist. You might listen mm-hmm. to that mad times, but to really consume a project, to listen to it the whole way through, even the songs you don't like, you're listening to a million times because it's a pain in the ass to skip through the tape and or whatever. And then you end up liking exactly. it. Yeah, yeah. And you're reading the booklet. We, we had to learn how to appreciate music. Mm. And we had to learn how to appreciate crafting an album. And like you said, the, the joy from opening up the CD and seeing the pictures and reading the credits and who produced what and where would it where was produced that and who mixed it. And, oh, my God, he had so-and-so produced this song and so-and-so wrote this. And we took a joy in that, in, in, in crafting that. And I think a lot, like you said, a lot of younger cats today, I mean, let's face it, we all at one point thought we were the baddest motherfucker on the mm-hmm. planet. Mm. Nobody could stop me. You get me? I felt that at one point. I think around, you know, 17, 18, 19, you know, I, I, I was making rap records, you know. I had a video on the box and shit. And, you know, <laughs> one time gaffle them up. I had the homies at Compton High School. And we, I, mean, I felt like King Kong. You couldn't. So my aspect, too, probably was, man, I'll fuck so-and-so and fuck so because. I just had that mentality like I'm, you know, it's me, you get me? But you learn to, I guess it takes time and learning to appreciate the shit before you and the shit around you and just getting respect from other artists who you feel are great artists. And I think once that started happening to me, it started turning me to the aspect of appreciating hip hop mm. you know and and listening to fucking ultramatic mc ultramatic mcs or listening to fucking utfo or listening to blue cheese or listening to tribe called quest and then going back and then listening to cube or nwa or too short or fucking uh souls of mischief you know i was one of them motherfuckers who could just listen to everything and listen to all kind of shit across the board. So it made me have more appreciation for other artists and respect for music. And I, like you said, it's just so many motherfuckers today. And you don't even have to be the popular motherfucker. You could just be some young motherfucker that, fuck it, I got a Draco and I done <laughs> shot up a thousand <laughs> niggas and I fucked your bitch and she fucked me. And after that, we popped some pills and did it all over again. 
the kids is like, oh my God, that shit is bomb. That's the bombest song ever. Right. And I'll be in the car with my son and I, I, I'm, I'm sure people pull up on the side of me and say, why has he got his head this <laughs> right like this? And my son be over here going crazy. And she, I fucked that bitch and then I did her like this and then I shot a nigga and then we came through and shot 20,000 more people. And, I be like, is that what my mom used to do when I used to be in the room playing fucking Curtis Blow and all them? Right. Because I didn't used to play that type of shit. You I was get playing y'all shit. I was getting in trouble. Yeah, your mom's probably was mad at playing <laughs> our shit, but I was playing like UTFO and shit like that. So I, the 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 shit that these kids have a choice to listen to, and that's why I say that's what run the fucking hip hop right now. Mm -hmm. That's why motherfuckers be wondering like, why is this motherfucker so popular? Why is this motherfucker so popular? And you be wondering like, God damn, my shit is conscious and it's making sense. And I'm putting words together that motherfuckers can understand, but they not eating my shit up like they eating up this. I fuck a block, like a fuck a fucking block, block. <laughs> you, you don't understand like, but the kids run this shit right, right. now. Mm. Like I said, back in my days, I had to have this to go buy a tape or something. Mm -hmm. Now, a motherfucking do this. Yeah. Fuck it, block, block it, block it. And if, it, if you watch something for three seconds and you don't like it, next, next, the next. The kids control it, you get me? No commitment. They can no, go to YouTube, Spotify, they can go to Pandora, and like you said, you go to YouTube, it's a, fuck a million, it's a trillion niggas rapping right All now. Day. Why? Because a nigga on the block can sell his shit, make him a little money, and go, fuck that, I'm gonna buy me a microphone, I'm gonna buy me a computer, and I'm gonna buy me this, and I'm gonna get in my motherfucking kitchen and start going, la, 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 la. <laughs> and then what's bad about that is you got three or four niggas around them that know that shit is garbage as fuck, mm. but won't nobody stand up and go, hold up, homie, your shit garbage. Them four niggas is behind them like, yeah, my nigga, yeah. They riding the wave. <laughs> and, 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 and that's how we get flooded with so much bullshit mm. that niggas get confused and think that's the fucking music mm. that we trying to represent. Right. That's why so many people are tired of that shit. I see them all day. You might not know it, but there's a lot of people tired of it because music used to have substance. Uh. Give a fuck if I told you we used to pull drive-bys. Mm. Motherfucker, I'm finna explain to you why we pulling fucking drive-bys. I'm not just finna tell you I'm finna wake up this morning, eat a bowl of fucking pill pop cereal, and then go <laughs> drive my Draco, and then just go shoot up the fucking block because I'm the hardest nigga. Right. I'm finna tell you why we finna pull this drive by. Mm. Last night, so and so happened, this happened, god damn it, fuck it, whoop, whoop, there you go. Right. The moral to the story is this what happens in the end. That's my music. Right. You get me? But, you know. We got kids, like, we're invincible. I'm, I'm Superman to the world. I got me a microphone, nigga, and you can't tell me shit. Right. I'm the hardest nigga on the block. I'm finna represent my hood, blood of crip. I served me some dope, and I done bought me a pistol. <laughs> and I fucked your baby mama. So, nigga, what? <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> it is, hey, it is. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I like yesterday watching a DMX and, a, and Snoop a versus battle mm. because they said, they was like, all you young niggas out here, like, put the pain in your music. You know what I mean? Like, put the pain. And for them to go 20 songs back to back, have two, three million people watching them, Definitely. you can't sit there and say, them old niggas won't, won't, won't. Because it ain't too many young niggas that can get that many people watching them consume their music or can play 20 records you know what I mean? That people are going to stay connected to. Even when Teddy Riley and all them went and did that shit. Look at all the people that are considered old. Look at the type of numbers that they're raking in. Mm. You know what I mean? That's because they have longevity in this game. You know what I mean? There's a lot of artists that I don't think 10 years from now they're going to be able to go tour. Mm -hmm. Because they shit so consumable and it didn't really touch anybody the way that it's supposed to. You know what I mean? When, when music touches you, 
you fuck with that for life. And it's not, not a lot of that that's happening right now. Exactly. You've been tuned into any of those versus battles? Because getting ready I've for this, told, yeah. I was thinking a little bit. I'm like, hmm, who would be a worthy opponent for MCA to go up against you in this know. world? Quick, yeah. nigga. Oh, yeah, I'm too, nigga. <laughs> I feel Y'all real. too. Yeah. I love that. Damn. I, I, I've been watching some of the versus battles. I mean, they're they're good for hip hop. I mean, it's something we need right now as far as the situations with with being stuck at home and not being able to get out and socialize and mm-hmm. go to concerts, whatever. It's a good thing because a lot of it has been focusing on music from our past. Mm-hmm. So it's being it, it's getting a chance to introduce some of these new cats or some of these you know new generations or people who ain't focusing in on the you know, the the DMXs or the Snoops or the Telly Rileys and baby faces or whatever. It's getting a chance for them to really see the foundation of where are where your music came from. Because basically this what came before you. These cats came before you and set the foundation. So it, it, it's kind of funny to to see that because it's now showing the youth or the gen- or the younger generation of what we came from and what was established. And you can see the kind of generational gap between our music, you get me? Some cats get it. Some cats know how to, let's face it, some cats know how to rap and mm-hmm. know how to create music. Mm-hmm. That's my thing first. Right. Create music that people can enjoy and not just some shit that you and five niggas in the studio feel is hard. Right. No, yeah, that's the crazy thing about the versus shit is because you always like need a way to take older existing content in general and make it feel new again, make it exciting again. And for me, like the Jadakiss battle, like I love fucking Jadakiss. That was mm-hmm. a huge rapper for me when I was like 18, 19, all through my early 20s. To, to hear and to see how much his verses or his songs mean still and how like effective that can be is amazing. But like a lot of people don't necessarily have a reason to dig back 20 years into the the music that exists or go back into Spotify and listen to an album from 20 years ago when they could be listening to some shit that came out last week. I mean, we, we need that. We need like things to explain. That's why the Straight Outta Compton shit made an existing story that maybe a lot of people felt like they already knew everything they needed to know about it and it introduced it in a new way and made a cultural moment out of it you know yes yeah, it, it, it like it's all it's always good to go back and, and see your history of what was created before you um I, I've always told my son, you know, that's why he's now, he listens to, you know, he'll go back every now and then, you catch him in his room, listening to some old school Snoop, or he'll maybe throw in one of my old songs. You'll even hear him throw in some old Michael Jackson or some Prince or some shit like that, because just by me showing him and people telling him, oh, your pops is this, man. You don't know who your pops is? And whoop de whoop and explaining to him. It makes him go back and wants to see, you know, what's the curiosity of people with the longevity and the history of what my pops did or whatever. So they come around a little bit. Mm, as they get older, they get a little bit more. Exactly. More ability to understand why shit matters. Yeah, because a lot of the thing that we love about rap music, like I, my friend Rico Reckless had his kid in here, like an eight-year-old kid one time. The kid was watching Lil Pump, Matt <laughs> Ox, Tay K, you know, it was a couple years ago. But like the, the way where to him, this is almost like kid music, you know? This is like not, this is, it's not even necessarily, like the kid is watching it like the same way that I would have been watching fucking Sesame Street when yeah, I was his exactly, age, you yeah, know? Exactly. But they're making these fun jingle type of songs that I'm not surprised. And they're, they're presenting a, a very exaggerated, dramatized version of what it is to be a young man. And that's very appealing to them. Like they're looking for answers. They're looking for people to sort of contextualize and explain what it is to be a man. and. You know that they're finding that through rap music. All the one kids way or on TikTok, man. Yeah, you well, know what I mean. They- yeah, TikTok and and like I yeah, they all looking for the identity of searching for something, and then like I said, they're looking at. The, the colorful, like you said, some shit I would look at on Saturday <laughs> mornings eating a bowl of Captain Crunch. Right. They're so fascinated by what they seeing and thinking that's the lifestyle of what reality is. Right. And 
you know, some of the motherfuckers take pills and die off and shit. That's the reality of their motherfucking life and, and their the situation. Ones. That's you happened to a fuckload of rappers that became popular around the same time we started doing this podcast. So if a kid needs an example of why you shouldn't do drugs, it's like, well, I could show you a whole bunch of rappers that you appreciate their catalog and they passed over the past few years. We don't even need to go back to ASAP games. We don't even need to go back to Pimp C. That's ancient history in comparison exactly. to the people who died in the last couple of years you know yeah that shit is ridiculous mm. I, like yeah, I said I, rapidly i don't condone shit i smoke weed and i don't give a <laughs> fuck but i smoke weed but i just don't get the fascination with mm. the fucking the lean and the fucking pill popping mm. shit i just don't get the fascin like i i just don't get it yeah because anybody who is a famous former lean head. Anybody who was famous for drinking a lot of lean 10 years ago, I guarantee you that they got a Vlad TV interview right now talking about how they don't <laughs> drink lean anymore because the shit is not a good long-term plan. Yeah, it just, I just don't get it. Like, I hated taking fucking cough syrup as a kid. Man, like, I don't too. understand the fascination <laughs> with, mm. with just... My fucker, you want to be, you just want to be medicated high, mm. like just out of existence, like just... I, I just don't get it. Like, I'm glad I, know, I didn't know about it when I was 16. Man, I'm, yeah, I, I'm <laughs> glad that shit didn't flow through our motherfucking, nah, 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 through nah. my teenage years of trying to, you know, motherfuckers said, here goes some weed, smoke some weed, and I was like, oh, okay, that that's good for me. I couldn't understand, even with back in the days with the crack and some mm -hmm. of the homies doing, shirt, you know, hitting the wet, and I could not understand it. I'm like, who the fuck won't be that high? Mm. Like, to where you don't even know you fucking high. You just zonked out. What is that? Like, right. I just don't get to understand. Like I said, I know some people have problems and some, but a, a lot of it now is like we got a lot of motherfucking niggas advocating for this shit. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of big motherfuckers who advocate for pill popping and lean drinking and shit. And I just don't get it because... It, the end result is, nigga, you fucked up. Just, just, in, just, just the end of it. You get me, nigga. You smoke some weed or have you a cocktail, you nigga. You good? Wanting to be that high? Yeah, you got some serious emotional issues. I think that you're trying to deal with, and maybe the pressures of this being where you at, and then this, you got pushed in this situation, and now you this popular motherfucker. And you know, there's a lot of motherfuckers can't handle that shit. Mm -hmm. They it make it look good. You got the chains on yep. and the diamonds and the women around and we got the fancy champagne. But then a lot of the motherfuckers, like you said, you hear about them later on and they they done either died off or something bad didn't happen because they can't deal with the really the realities of what this shit brings. This fucking music shit will bring you to a point to where you can't handle certain shit mm. if you're not level headed. And if you fucked up all the time, then shit, that's a bad fucking transition. Yeah. And I told my, like with me, my big homies used to tell me, nigga, you need to be alert at all times. Oh, yeah. So oh, I wouldn't take nothing that's going to keep me off deck. You know what I'm saying? Because the one second that I could be high as fuck, sleeping, slipping in the car, oh, yeah. a nigga could come knock me down. And I'm off of this earth after that. And we ain't got a lot of homies that done, done <laughs> fell off like that. Just like that. Especially being in that lifestyle mm -hmm. and being in that predicament. You got to be alert all the time, back against the wall, checking your surroundings and everything. That's why motherfuckers used to trip off me in the early days when I used to go out of town and go to clubs. And the first thing is I do is I look for the back door, <laughs> I look for the exits. I still do that. And then I get somewhere <laughs> where my fucking back is against the wall, no doors behind me, and I can see everything coming in front of me. Hmm. That's just being, that's just neighborhood smart. Right. Fuck that. And and having that allowed me to go out. Motherfuckers be like, damn, you don't do that. Nah, man, because I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what these niggas is about. And I got to be on deck. Niggas coming over with bottles of drink and all that shit. And I be like, nah, I don't drink. Nigga, you don't drink. Nigga, you, you <laughs> ate guns. You supposed to be. I'm like, nah, I don't drink. Yeah. I'm like, you don't want no drink. Nigga, they coming you, over nigga. with buckets of just fifths of liquor. And niggas is down in that nigga. And I'm standing there like. I do it every time. I still do it to his day. Right. Because you just have to be curious and like, I don't never I don't want to be nowhere that fucked up. Yeah. To where niggas gotta carry me to the car or I'm passed out at the table or some shit like that. You in a business where 
a lot of motherfuckers ain't to be trusted. Facts. And even though you might be cool with everybody, I guarantee you it's a couple of motherfuckers that don't like you. Mm. And they can't even tell you why. You still got that in you though that when you're in a new place or whatever that you you you're very very alert like your you, you upbringing brought you I'm still even way. though I feel I'm older and I have you know I don't like I go wherever the fuck I want to now. Back in the days I used to be like nah, we can't go over there. Like motherfucking rap, you know, they didn't know shit. You know, back in the days, we used to promo tour. You used to put you in a van and drive you all around the city, different record stores. You have to sign motherfucking autographs. I used to be like, no, we can't go to that record store. Mm -hmm. We can't go over there. <laughs> we can't go. And the record labels be like, why? You have an in-store. We have to sign autograph. Oh, you And I used to look at the list, and I used to tell them, send me the shit before, you, before we go. Because motherfucker... Nigga, my early rap days, man, they pulling us up in Inglewood at the fucking warehouse record Hell store. No. Mm. I'm like, we can't go up in there. They pulling us up in West Side, you know, at the record store in the shopping center off of Rosecrans and Central. We can't go up in there. Mm. I got motherfucking records out and shit and videos all out and niggas standing in front of Compton High and blue rags and niggas know <laughs> we bang from over here and you niggas want to get out and go sign autographs like it's all up good. in there? Like you understand their perspective. Understand like shit. I, I'm thinking about it from that dude's perspective and hell no, like that then, does well, seem kind of disrespectful. And, and then with the centennial, same shit. And then with the crazy shit. He used to put up fucking posters in the window, let motherfuckers know you're coming and shit. So now you, now you got niggas in the park they and waiting they just you. wait. Oh, yeah, them niggas supposed to be up here today. At what time? At 4 o'clock they be up. Then you pull in the parking lot in the van and be looking. There's a car right there. There's another carload of niggas. There's another. Man, if y'all don't go up in there and tell them motherfuckers we can't come in today. Here, let me sign these motherfuckers in the car right here. Take the motherfuckers in and we pulling out to the next spot. Right. You know, man, you didn't play back in them days, man. Real right. shit. So you had to be cautious of where you, it's all times, even today. I don't give a fuck. I could be in the whitest of whitest neighborhoods or whatever. I'm still like, where we at? If I'm at a game, in my son's game, and it's that football, sports shit, no whatever, but I'm still like, Every fucking 10 <laughs> seconds, I'm looking around. I'm checking to see who coming through the gate, who was them motherfuckers who just walked up. Oh, okay, I see niggas over there in the car. It's three niggas on the other side of the field. Oh, I'm peeping out everything because I want to, if it go down, I want to know who, where, what, and how. And full and control. Being. That's, That's it. That's it, why it's, I tell him too. When I come over here, I, he be like, I tell him all the time, I said, I, I, keep, I bring my gun in the car. Cause I don't know what rapper you gonna have in here. What's, who the fuck going? Oh me, I circle. The, I circle the block twice. <laughs> here, I circle the block twice. Oh, check out my surroundings. <laughs> see where I'm at. I pull through the alley. Look at everybody getting out their cars. Go to the end of the alley. Bust a you. Come back. Then sit in the car for a minute and be like, okay. I'm peeping. I see baby right there. I see my homeboy right there getting out. Okay, let me check, check. Then let a nigga know. Yeah, I'm over here, right here. I'm in the back. I'm in the alley. Blah, blah, blah. Bingo. Anything go down, nigga know where I'm at, where I'm at, who I was with. Bingo. Right. You have to be. <laughs> I tell my son that shit all the time. Where you at? Oh, I'm over so-and-so house. Who there? Who you with? Name the niggas. Because if I know somebody there that ain't, nigga, I'm, putting, I'm on my way to come get your ass right now. Right. I'm like, just because you straight, you don't know who you don't know the motherfuckers around you straight. Right. I used to say that about taking certain niggas when I used to go on tour, taking certain niggas from the neighborhood. Mm -mm. Mm. <laughs> and it's a gang of them. Hmm. Who am I gonna take this week? I know this nigga gonna start trouble. <laughs> I know he gonna blah blah. I know you have to pick certain because you. Not that I can control nigga. I know who gonna be able to handle dumb shit. When it really can just be, you know, certain niggas, as soon as a nigga go boo, he ready to <laughs> bop, 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 and right. I don't give a fuck, no explanations. It's just some niggas like that because of what you went through. So you have to know 
who you're around, who's able to be whatever in the situations. And that's, like I said, going through that type of shit enables me to give my son them lessons. Mm. You get me? Even though you might not be in the surrounding, it's always a slick motherfucker in the bunch. I'm right. telling you. I don't give a fuck. That's smart. It's always a slick motherfucker in the bunch. So watch it. That's why I tell him all the time. You might not be growing up in gangbanging infested shit. You, you in some good shit. But still, you never know what the intentions of the niggas are around you. Mm -hmm. So watch what you, nigga, per perfect example. Nigga asked me one day, I wanna go to the mall with my friends. I wanna go buy some shit. I go, but you the only one with money. Why them other three niggas wanna go with you? Why you wanna hang out with them three niggas? They ain't got no money. I can take you to the mall, get what you want. No, I don't go with them. I tell a nigga, something gonna happen, watch. Don't go. Nigga called me an hour later. Dad. I said, what I fucking tell you? Well, somebody robbed him or? No. Shoplifting shit. I said, motherfucker, what I tell you? I already know what's gonna happen before it happened because mm -hmm. I done been put in that shit before. Mm -hmm. So I'm already telling you for what's finna happen. You gonna go buying shit and motherfuckers with no money is gonna want shit because they see you buying shit too. It's the mentality of a young motherfucker. Mm. I want to. You ain't got a dollar in your pocket. I don't give a fuck. You just bought a $200 pair of so-and-so. That's some real ass shit. Cause that I, I I knew people who got arrested for exact same thing. And when you're 14 and you just are in the store and stuff, you don't have that like safety precaution in your brain. That's like maybe I shouldn't shoplift this. And I, I got arrested for shoplifting at 13. <laughs> this camera's all over the goddamn and, store. And I didn't even know. You, I didn't know about the cameras yet. You but, ain't thinking. No. You ain't giving a fuck. Your mental, your mind stayed at 14 or 15. Is I don't get. I want. Mm -hmm. Especially when you see a homie whipping out and buying mm -hmm. and you can't buy. Oh, I'm still come up. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. And, and like I try to tell you, I'm trying to save you from certain shit mm. because I don't want to see you have to go to what I think. I was going to jail every fucking two weeks just for standing on the block. Mm -hmm. Loitering, they call it. Man, I'm having to call my I'm having to call my motherfucking you don't want to call my motherfucking mama talking about uh you gotta come bail me out of this. What the fuck? And I'm talking about back in our day, it was less regular. Motherfucker, police come through and you on the block, you going to jail that night. I don't give a fuck. Right. And and I ain't doing nothing but standing here. Yeah, niggas called loitering. Get your motherfucking ass in the car. Take you down to Compton PD station <laughs> and your ass sit in the holding tank with a couple of enemies for fucking two, three hours and then they want to call your mama at three in the morning and tell her come get you. Mm. Man, I used to get cussed the fuck out for that shit. Tell them about the Tuesdays. Growing up, Tuesdays, gang sweep day. Oh, Better not be outside. Oh, don't be Compton. outside. Oh, that's when you're going to jail. If I'm just on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays in Compton, growing they coming up, through. They sweeping up everybody that they can find. They don't even care where you're from. They ain't going to ask get, you nothing. They ain't you ain't got no drugs on you, no warrants, nothing. no fuck, nothing. And they'll you let you on the, the streets on Tuesdays. They coming through your hoods and they taking everybody they can. It's a way for them to clear the streets. And if you were on probation, you may do some time for just walking outside. Wow. So yeah, you go to <laughs> you go to subs, you go to Compton Substation, and that's when this was back when it was Compton PD, the white car, the crooked people. White car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's where they got rid of them. Yeah, man. Com <laughs> Compton PD is. Woo. I told you but, that the other yeah, day. Yeah, they yeah they come pick you up, come through the hoods, pick niggas up, take them to the substations, and we just. In a holding tank for hours. So, how is your perspective on the state of policing in LA, or to the extent that you're associated with it, or even in the know about it? Like, like how has it changed over the years? And what's your uh, your opinion? <laughs> it, changed. Of it? it ain't changed. It ain't, ain't changed. Change. <laughs> ain't shit changed at and, all. And, and let me tell you something. Not to disrespect, because it's fucked up that George Floyd had to lose his life. No disrespect to the Black Lives Matter shit. We've been seeing this fucking shit since I was a fucking kid. Not to, not to downplay. Lord, I swear not to downplay. This shit been going on since I was fucking able to crawl. Motherfucker, 
getting beat up and choked and fucking fucked up by the police? Are no, you fucking kidding that's me? That's normal. Mm. For for where I'm from, <laughs> it's it's normal. You didn't even trip off of it because it happened. They just you didn't really... trip off of if the police picked you up and fucked you up right. and kicked your fucking ass or broke your jaw or kicked your fucking teeth in with steel toe boots and none of that. We never complained about the shit. We never told or reports or nothing, <laughs> nothing because nobody did shit about it. It wasn't going to get done. Now, in the day of social media and so many people and eyes on everything and just so much uprest of just bullshit because it's publicized now. Motherfucker, you could have came through Compton on a daily and film that shit every day. The, like the George <laughs> Floyd thing, they got a really, really good video of it, and that's what made it what it was. Because that of situation course. unfolds probably all the time. But all the, over the media country. chooses to put that in your face now. Right. Because they had that video to go on. Like that's what made the people upset and that's what gave the media I something mean, to work with. Let's face it, if there wasn't a motherfucker standing out there with their camera, it wouldn't, mm -hmm. it wouldn't it would have been just another motherfucker who got killed by the police. They would have swept it under the rug the, and you would have found no evidence. The Ahmad Arbery situation Same from shit. Georgia, we didn't know anything about it for months and months and then the video comes out and it becomes huge news. And, and now, thus, we have Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. We have everything, you get me? But like I said, to some people who are able to visualize now because it's put in their face, it's so fucking shocking. Oh, my God, fuck, really? That's what they did? Motherfucker, come here on a daily. You'll see this shit every day before now it's everyone's attention. Mm. You get me? Because now motherfuckers is on like, mm, you better not beat a motherfucker's <laughs> ass because it'll be a nigga watching you. It'll be a fuck, whatever. It ain't, it ain't no but like I said, before that shit happened, mm -hmm. before George Floyd happened, I guarantee you could have rolled through the motherfucking town on any given day and seen a nigga's ass thrown on the ground, choked, beat up, blah, blah. You get me? It happens. It's been happening. It I got down like that. I got down like that. <laughs> it happened before me. I got. I, we all went through it. If you was gang banging in my day, and you was hanging out, you either got took into the holding cell, threw in the holding cell with enemies. You got dropped off in fucking enemy neighborhoods. What I just tell you? Yeah, they didn't give that. a fuck. I just, he said that was I the worst thing him, they ever I just did told to you, him, right? I said I told him one time I was driving. I was driving, I don't know, I forgot, I, was, I think I was driving through Southside, right? And I was going home and the cop pulled me over and he looked at me, he was, he looked up the address, he said, oh, you, you from, I'm like, no, no, I'm chilling. Went 20, 30 minutes, ain't said nothing, came back, tried to break my key. Cause he knew I was in the wrong neighborhood. Mm -hmm. He tried to, he tried to really break my key so the nigga get you. And he was like, he broke your key. I'm like, nigga, the cops in Compton is, them niggas is crazy. It's, it's just been, like I said, it's been something we've just been having to deal with and go through for, what, ever? I mean, like, it's no different. I mean, shit, up until, shit, 10 years ago, I'm living in fucking probably the whitest neighborhood around. I go to a subway, tattoos on, tank top on. Highway Patrol walks in. He couldn't even order his food because he's so busy looking at me and watching, looking at my tattoos and whatever, whatever. So I'm ordering my food. He couldn't even help himself. He had to ask me, what are you doing out here? And Straight up. Where was this again? Murrieta. Oh, okay. So you're... Mm. What are you doing out here? And I turned around and looked at him and I said, I'm ordering food. He said, no. What are you doing? Because he saw the big Compton on the back of my arm. and what He said, what, did you get paroled out here? <laughs> Straight up. Like, motherfucker, like, why are you in Murrieta? Like, you're black? You're fucking tattooed up with Compton all over. So you must have someone who live out here that you got paroled to. Right. I said, motherfucker, I, live, I moved out here. Right. He said, you did? Like, why? I said because I bought a house. He was like, oh, like, I'm like, damn, like, <laughs> but like situations like that, that makes me go, it's no different. Like, it, it ain't no different. Motherfuckers just, 
don't understand that certain people or our race of people we shouldn't be in certain places or certain situations or whatever so it's really odd for them to to have to witness that like damn you're able to leave compton and move to marietta like and you're not here because you were forced to be here like it wasn't a prison sentence or whatever. <laughs> You're here voluntarily. Like, right. motherfuckers don't understand that. But we normal motherfuckers, too. If I was at Burger King and I saw a dude with a big-ass Compton tattoo, there would be a part of me, if I was in Marietta for some reason, there would be a part of me that would just want to be like, so what, what are you doing out here? Like, like why? Like, you know, you just don't see a lot of Compton tattoos in there. I could kind of. Exactly. I'm sure the cop was coming from a place of uh, bigotry and small mindedness, but there would be like a part of my mind that I'd want to be like, what's going on? Why are you but doing that's like the Trayvon Martin situation. He's seen a guy, right, that he don't. He sees a, a young black kid with a hoodie on walking in his neighborhood and instantly, like you right. said, the bigotry comes out. Now he's like, he must be up to trouble because look at this guy. Right. Come on, man. If it was a little white kid, same hoodie, you know what I mean? Just strolling down the street, he wouldn't attack them in any, you know what I mean? Yeah. Our, nice. our position of being racial profiled, like I said, has been around ever since I was able to step off the porch as an adolescent and get on my bike and just ride down the street and being associated with being in a gang. It just, the neighborhoods you live in, you're black. I mean, they gang bang over here. So why would I assume that for any different, that you were any different from any other black male I've encountered over here? So that's the mind state that they get. So it's just, it's an everyday cycle for them to be like, we're patrolling the streets of Compton. Everybody gang bangs. Everyone sells dope. No one's innocent. Everyone's guilty. And no one's going to care if we fuck over people or fuck them up or whatever, whatever. Because this is why we came or we were put here to patrol this fucking jungle. You get me? Mm-hmm. Tame the motherfucking animals and shit. Make sure everything is un- is is not in uprest. And long as we keep motherfuckers the way, nobody's gonna tell us that we can do anything different. You get me? We've been doing this shit for years. So fuck it. Beat up a couple of motherfuckers, harass and abuse a couple of motherfuckers. Who's going to tell? Who's going to listen? Right. What do you tell your kid about how to deal with the police? You know, he's like his dealings with the police are probably going to be very different than the ones that you had as a kid. But how do you prepare him for the tricks and the weird shit that they I might tell, try to pull? I tell him, you know, you're getting ready to start driving. You're going to have to be aware of racial profiling from police. I say you just have to, you know, you're a black kid. And you are in a, a area where, you know, it's not it's not as bad, but you still can be profiled because of your skin color and who you are as a fucking African American kid. So I tell him just be just be aware of police harassment. Mm-hmm. You get me? You're you're not no different than me or AD or anybody else of my skin color. So just learn to be accepting of police harassment because it might come. Mm -hmm. So don't get adamant. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't get to, uh, uh, you know, because you have to treat this shit like I I treat it like getting a common code. It might come. You're going to be sick for a minute, but long as you can withstand the bullshit, then you'll be out of your, they'll be out of your hair and you can get on with your business. But thinking that you can be in a position to express yourself about that shit, don't bother. Because regardless of what you see on TV, motherfuckers ain't around every day with cameras and shit. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of that shit. You might get a good cop one day. You might get a bad one. I've done it. I've been able to be in situations to where motherfucker go give you my your license registration. Nothing wrong. Here you go. Have a nice day. You get some motherfuckers that first thing they ask you is when they walk up on the car, what the fuck you doing over here? And you already know it's bad from there. So it's it just it's 
basically who you have to deal with. Mm. A lot of motherfucking cops is unhappy. Yeah. Who knows why? I'm unhappy too sometimes when I go to go to fucking work. Mm. When I got to go to the studio and sit up till 3, 4 in the morning. I'm not happy about that. <laughs> right. Got to go home at 4 o'clock, then get up at 6 to get a kid to school. And I'd be like, man, fuck this shit, man. I'd be mad as hell. But you're not in a position to like to where I'm basically ready to go. inflict that upon no. somebody, you know? I mean, yeah. I might yell at a motherfucker and cuss at a nigga. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A motherfucker who get the delayed rogue or turned it too goddamn slow. Man, move, motherfucker. <laughs> Karan, my son, like, dad, the light's red. Like... <laughs> Oh shit! Cause motherfucking, <laughs> motherfucking light ain't turning fast enough. You know, I might get a little pissed off, but I know where motherfuckers have to be able to know when and where to exert their aggression. Mm. You know, or their frustration. If I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be frustrated because something else happened and take it out on my son. Right. You get me? I, I I try to control that shit. It is what it is for what the frustration comes from. So you have to learn how to motherfucker. If you mad because you got to come into work today, oh well, I get it. But that don't be be mad at her, him, and him because motherfucker, I had to come here today too, yeah. just like you. So you have to give people that cert that that same level of respect that you would want when you were in a place of not being happy. You mm -hmm. get me? Because I don't know what the fuck is wrong with you. I can just tell that today ain't a good fucking day. <laughs> <laughs> Go to McDonald's and motherfucker. Yeah. Fuck your order up on purpose. So anything. I mean, shit, every, we all go through that. As yep. humans and motherfucking, it's not one motherfucker around here that can say they go through every day is a good fucking day. Uh -huh. We all have certain days where shit is fucked up. But we have to learn how to not not push that aggression on other motherfuckers who might like your girl, your kids, the fucking mailman. You get me? Motherfucker, my check ain't here yet. I don't get man. <laughs> Nigga like, I don't, I, dude, I just deliver the fucking mail. Right. So I think with, 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 with police, they already have a certain authority feel. Right. You get me? And I, I've, never, I've never got that. You get me? You might be the you might be in a bigger position to me, but I don't feel that a cop should have to get more reach. Like I'm not in the military, or you're not my father, or whatever. So the respect you give me, I give you back. Some dudes feel that that represents a higher authority than regular motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where policing gets confused and it gets twisted because when they put the uniform on, it makes them think that I have a certain authority over the common motherfucker. And and it's typically a dude who's like the most ordinary fucking dude in the world. Like I was reading the New York <laughs> Times profile of the Derek Chauvin, the guy who killed George Floyd. He sounds like the most ordinary fucking boring ass life that you could ever imagine from someone and then to see the way that he acted when he all of a sudden was in a position where he could physically manhandle somebody it just really clues you in they're like a lot of these people who end up in these positions it's not a job it's a job where it demands the best of people but there's nothing about that job that would attract the best people you know like if you were to go to fucking nasa or tesla or some shit there's going to be some of the smartest people in the entire world working there because yeah. they're getting paid. You ain't finna get no Thanks. smarty motherfucker. Right. Go be nah. a cop. Because you, I, you're I, not going to be making that much go money. To the FBI. It's a hard <laughs> fucking job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Well, well, like, <laughs> yeah. You could have been a fucking brain surgeon. Yeah. Why are you patrolling the streets of. Like, it's just like yeah. something wrong with. And I get right. it. it. It takes a certain level of motherfucker. But like I said, it takes a certain motherfucker who also goes. I'm finna go be a policeman. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? Right then and there, <laughs> I think motherfuckers should be. Why do you wanna be a cop? I right. mean, honestly, why? Here's 10 other jobs that will make you the same amount of exactly. money. Exactly. They'll probably be easier, the better schedule, less hours. Why Why you wanna be a cop? What is it exactly? You know? And, and I, I feel like a lot of them, a lot of cops, you know, they was bullied as kids. You know what I mean? They never had that authority. Over nobody. I mean, do a do a motherfucker have the mentality of are there any motherfuckers who go, I wanna be a better police. Mm. I wanna be able to because I've seen 
I mean, it might be some people with that mentality, but they get overshadowed mm -hmm. because the Thanks. reputation that we have, and not just our, our anyone mm -hmm. who's had an experience, because I don't want to keep putting it on black people. Anybody who's had a fucked up experience with the police feels like police is fucked up. You ever seen Serpico? Like, if yes. you try, if you try to be the good cop, it's not going to be good for you. And that's how you, <laughs> and, and, and that's how I feel about po people who enter this. I don't know this fucking this fucking shit of going. Okay, you know, like I said, when I was a kid, when I was five or six. I'm going to be a policeman. I'm going to be a fireman. Yeah. You know, because that's that typical American dream of the kid, apple pie, baseball. Because I grew up with that mentality. Mm. My father worked at General Motors. My mom was a fucking nurse. I mean, I could have been a good kid. I grew up in Compton, though. You get me? And my father left the home. So I I got introduced to the pitfalls. But as a young kid, my dreams of being the all American fucking apple pie baseball, being a doctor, lawyer, that's because that's the program that I followed in school, elementary school, you know. Well, the cops are the good people, the firemen mm -hmm. or the doctor or the lawyer. So that was my trait. And then the older I got, I, why y'all fucking with me? I ain't do nothing. I'm just riding my bike or, but because I fit the criteria, I fit the profile of being a young black kid in a fucking gang infested neighborhood. So you must be one too. So my attitude turned to, damn, police is fucked up. And I ain't never had even had a bad experience up until I started banging. You know, my perception was, but then to hear the stories, you start going, damn, police is fucked up. So you start thinking, do, do anybody go out to be a policeman to be good? Or is it just to feel the authority figure over the place you're finna patrol and police? I know it ain't for nothing but a gang of gang banging ass niggas and Mexicans and you know, white trailer trash people and whatever. So fuck it. <laughs> I'm going to be able to be the fucking authority over that fucking land and that community because yeah. now I get to patrol around in my car. I got this back. You hear me? <laughs> and You're then, a legal gangster. You know? And then yeah. ain't, ain't nobody going to fuck. Who would dare to fuck with a police? You mm -hmm. get me? Your mentality hanging on the block even when they come through is... Man, fuck. You Shirts get up. Me? Shirts up. We, you we, get ain't, me? we ain't did nothing today. You just went from telling niggas fuck you cuz and whatever, whatever, <laughs> to sitting on the corner telling the nigga, yes, sir. Yep. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, no, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And I be feeling like, why, why are we serving these motherfuckers? Uh, like, like, he's not, you're not my father. You work a re you work in a nine to five. Like, like, like you working your job and my father going to work every day and that man and that man and that man. But they feel the authority. And I think that's sometimes where it get confused because you give anybody a little feel of power. They go, <laughs> they got power around this motherfucker <laughs> shit. Oh, nigga, they bang over there. Nigga, watch this. Pull my car up over there. Get out my car. Pull up my belt a little bit, yeah. show that shiny <laughs> shit. Niggas is in panic when I pull up. Yep. You Every, get me? Everybody else got to hide their gun. You got yours on the outside. Nigga, my shit, nigga, shine his day, showing you that big motherfucker right there. Like, yeah, yeah. what's up? What's cracking over here today? What y'all doing? Yeah, yeah. Nobody got no dope, no good. Just over there to fuck with niggas. Right. You get me? But that's to pull up and show that authority. Because mm -hmm. watch all these niggas bow down when I hit this block. Thanks. You get me? Ain't one and one, and the nigga who think he bad finna be in the back of my motherfucking car. That's the one that's going to shit on for it sure. Be, get me? It might be crying. Come on, man. <laughs> so like, who who chooses to who to be in that position? And like I said, of course, I've knew a, I've knew cops. I've knew cops being being a hip hop artist. Niggas who grew up in the hood or grew up in Compton or whatever turned to cops and was going on tour with us and being private security. Niggas is cool as a motherfucker. I would never on any day 
worry about running into that motherfucker on the street. That's right. cool as fuck. But then it's certain, like I said, there's just certain dudes who enter this profession who might feel this 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 need for authority, this need for feeling I'm superior. And you have to question those applicants or those motherfuckers who coming in to join the force who really like, motherfucker, I could tell you ain't finna try to be no good motherfucker. I know you just wanna roll through the neighborhoods and fuck with motherfuckers and beat up on a couple of motherfuckers and show your authority. And they don't live You gotta be able to question that. Right. They don't yeah. live in our communities either. And so, you as a and yeah. you as a and you as a motherfucker who's finna hire this person mm. is supposed to be doing this psychiatric evaluations. You you can't tell me that half of these motherfuckers that you let come through here, you already know they bad for business. Mm. But fuck it, we need we need cops. Right. Because like the best thing that could kind of happen for policing would be for there to be a very motivated, mobilized percentage of people of young people who wanted to become cops and wanted to be better cops. But just, it feels like every single thing associated with having that job, having to fit into that organization, not to mention the types of people that would be drawn to that, you're just not going to get that. You're not going to get this big upswelling of people who have better intentions for society taking on that job. And see, my grandma used to tell me all the time that when they were growing up, the police lived in their community. They, mm. they lived next to the same people that they were supposed to protect and serve. And that made them respect the police. That made the police respect them because they had to see these people every day at the grocery stores and stuff. These motherfuckers don't know us when they coming down our block. They getting off their shift. They going to the valley somewhere. Hell yeah, they, 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 <laughs> jump, <clears throat> they jumping on that freeway driving 40 <laughs> minutes away. They gone. And that's another thing. I feel like people, when you police in these areas that you know, drug infested, gang bangers, whatever, you have to have someone police in those areas who knows what those motherfuckers are going through and why they in those situations. So it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be advisable to put a motherfucking white cop in a neighborhood where it's nothing but gang infested niggas at. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not cool. They're already going to be feeling like, mm -hmm. As opposed to seeing a, a, a young black kid coming through there, understanding like, oh, well, shit, nigga, I grew up in in in, in L.A. Oh, I grew up in Watts. So I, I could understand so I could better police this area. And knowing that when I pull up on niggas who's standing outside, that it's not a fishy situation and I don't have to pull up and harass niggas. I know niggas hang out. You get me? Or when I see two or three niggas in the car, do I really have to racial profile them to think they finna go do a drive-by on a nigga? Or could they just be three niggas in the car ride together? You get me? Those, they have to put those type of motherfuckers in those areas that have lived, known somebody, dealt with somebody who deals with the situation of where you grow up. Niggas are products of their environment. So if you get somebody who knows what the environment is, then the policing could be better and you won't have as much racial profiling, fucking abuse and all that shit. And then it would only be situations where we would need because then niggas wouldn't feel like it would have to be so much uprest. Mm, that's facts. I'm very glad we got to get your perspective on that for sure. Yeah. Glad we brought that up. Hey, I, I wanted to ask you this. Have you watched Menace with your kid? I haven't watched it with him, but he has seen it. Did he have uh, thoughts on it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it fit in pretty well with everything he knew about you as a kid? <laughs> Is that your dad? Yeah, that motherfucker <laughs> like, why y'all watching this shit? I see this motherfucker every day. So, you know, he right. watched it. I mean, his friends be like, oh, your pops, you know, mm -hmm. the movies, you know. But my my son, I think that because I lived I try to do normal shit mm. I try to not you know depict the you know that's why I don't bring him to shit like this and I try to keep him out of my 
so we have the regular dad mm. and son connection. So it's not him just being fascinated by this lifestyle. And next thing you know, he want to be a rapper and all this other shit. And I got so I try to keep my music shit away and my profession and just try to be dad at home with him. So that's why he's normal with me mm. and he doesn't trip off of. My dad got plaques on the wall or my dad was in the movie or my dad did a song with Kendrick or, you know, he's like, why y'all tripping off of him? Mm. So and <laughs> I kind of and I kind of like it that way, because then I get that normal shit with him. Mm. I don't get the, you know, I, I wish I got the normal shit when it came to finances and shit with his <laughs> ass. Mm. You get me, you know. But I get the normal shit, you know. I get the nah, dad, don't drop me off right here, or let me go to my friend's house, or you don't have to stay. And I'm like, nigga, I want to come see you work <laughs> out or throw the football. No, you can sit in the car and shit like that, you know. Because I think he feels it takes away from him. Right. Because when dad show up, all the attention goes from his ass to, right. oh, you see, uh, so... He he want his shine, and I want him to have that shit. And so we all know that when you meet someone whose dad is famous or rich or powerful or whatever, that kind of changes how you think of their kid because you kind of know that they had a different specific experience growing up, and it does it, it it triggers your brain. Like if you were to meet somebody right now and you thought they were cool, and then you found out like, oh, that's that's Dr. Dre's kid. You're gonna be like, wow. Your whole like, perception exactly. gonna change. You're gonna have exactly. so many assumptions about what his life has been like and so many questions. And that as a kid, you wanna be independent of that. You wanna be your own little island. You don't wanna be, you know, the product of your father. And I think the beauty of that is a lot of his friends, because I started out with him, like I put him in sports at three years old. And then I my connection was head coach in the teams. Mm. So I think because a lot of his friends been around me since they were little kids and couldn't fathom what MC8 was or movies or whatever, <laughs> because they have grown up with him too. They walk in the door like, what's up coach? What's up coach? That's it, I, I get nothing else. So I try to be, I, I keep the normal shit with him. Mm. Motherfucker take the trash out, clean your room up. You know, all, all kind of just try to be normal because I don't want him to get caught up in, oh, my dad's this. And then, then that turns his shit differently. And then that what makes people to start looking at him like he's a different kid or privileged kid. And what, nah, nigga, you ain't privileged. Definitely. I went to, nah, nah, this my shit. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my shit you got to earn your shit so that's why you playing football and you doing your that's your thing this right. is my thing that's your thing so that's how we keep it but is there a part of you that wants to get in this like make a song with your kid just because nah. it's fun no no he, nah. he doesn't look at rap as just like a fun oh, hell thing yeah. you can mess he around wanna, with oh, okay. he want to rap it, it, all the time. You hear him in there with his little block block a block 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 <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'm like like, man, what the fuck you in there playing and shit? Turn that shit down. And I've already told Yeah, he's came to me with, you know, we want rap and me and the homies and we should do this. And 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 it got about that far. Mm. And I was like, man, come on, man. You play football. Your thing is sports. Going to school. You can get you a college education. You're going to do something on that level. And this shit ain't, this shit ain't for everybody, man. Hell no. It's not. See, when I listen to your music now, too, though, I very much like get the feeling and it's why I think that you're still relevant is because it feels like you're just really doing the shit that you're having fun with. Like you're working with Premier. I'm hearing you with Lady of Rage. It really feels like I just got to uh, I'm about to drop an album right now called Lessons. Uh, my first single I just did with Conway. Right. We just shot a video last week. Oh, yeah. I forgot yeah. about that because we we're supposed to interview him today. Yeah. It's actually happening next week now. But that. <laughs> I just I can't wait to hear that. That sounds oh, man, crazy. I'll play it for you. Oh, but, hell man, yeah. um I'm supposed to be shooting a video with Dave East this weekend. My name I mean, is amazing too. Yeah. I'm 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 just trying to stay relevant. And like you said, I'm not looking for accolades. Right. I'm not looking for the billion dollar paycheck. You get me? I've been through this hip hop shit for a while. Right. To where I'm comfortable. I've all I, I never came into it with I was gonna be the next big big thing. Never, never had that mentality. 
even when I was whatever. I never, I just like to make it music. Mm. Like right now, if I didn't make a dollar, I still want to go to the studio and turn the equipment on and make a rap song because I can do it. Right. And that's because it's fucking easy to the me. The product is good. Yeah. It's still good. My, my dope shit. My, dope, <laughs> my, my shit ain't bunk. You get me? <laughs> Niggas still get high. But I ain't, sell, I ain't selling no bunk bullshit, I'm telling you. My shit is still potent. So, and that's one of the reasons why. And then when I hear motherfuckers, when I say, ah, I might not do no more shit. I might just concentrate on trying to get my son to college or working on my clothing line or whatever. And motherfuckers go, why? You still make good music. You still make good music, and it's relevant. So yeah. I do it because of that. Right, and I mean, somebody like Premier, like, what was what that relationship like? Because that was genuinely exciting for me as a. I've been knowing Primo you know? shit. I've been knowing Primo since I started. Mm. You get me, and he was one of the first dudes on the East Coast who accepted me as an artist, but as a like real friend, like. Right. Primo would come pick me up from the airport, like shit like that. Stay at his crib, you know. I mean, everybody used to hang with Primo and that. I used to fuck with Nas when he was first started and Tretch and Buster and they all used to be. So we used to man, pre pick us up in the MPV van and we go rolling around smoking and Primo first introduced me to Blunts. I didn't know what the fuck Blunts was. <laughs> wow, really? I go to New York in like 89, 90 and I'm like, the fuck y'all smoking the weed out of? <laughs> and he's like, oh, y'all don't smoke blunts in L.A.? I said, hell fucking no. Nah. <laughs> Nigga opening up, and that was the big Philly blunts back then. Yeah. He split in the Philly with the razor and then dumped all the shit out. And I'm like... I'm like, oh, no, nah, hell no, nah, primo. <laughs> he's like, I'm telling you, nigga, after you hit this, you'll never smoke. And I swear to God, never again. That from it. that day, and that was 20 years ago. Wow. So Primo was one of the first motherfuckers I met on tour. We connected. Like I said, we would do primo, we would do promo tours together. I would see him and Guru all the time on the road. Chi Town, Texas, Florida. We always connected. And from there, man, we've been I, mean, I could call Primo right now. But oh eight, what's up? I'm in my son's baseball game and blah, blah, blah. And we just we just, he's one of the people I call a real friend outside of fucking music. Oh, yeah. It's a motherfucker I can call in the middle of the night with no problem, he's gonna pick up the phone. And if he don't answer, within 10 minutes, he'll call me right back. Right. So that's the respect I have for Primo. And I could call him right now, I need this done. I need a mix, I need a scratch, I need a beat. Give me two days and I'm on it. And he doesn't put himself in that, well, you know, I'm. DJ Premier, right. you know, you're asking me for a beat, you're asking me for eight, I got you. So that's why me and him connect so good. That's, yeah. that's my dude. That's a beautiful thing. I love seeing people age gracefully into their older twilight years in the music game, you know, because there's a lot of people who try to appeal to a younger audience and they're just not able to really, if you're not true to yourself at that point, you're just not going to be able to pull it off convincingly, you know? You have to stay true to yourself because that's what brought you here. And I try mm. to remind dudes of that, like, don't ever forget what got you to here. Right. You get me? You got to remember you came from here. So you can't remember those steps that you went through. And like I say again, that's why I call my new project Lessons. The lessons we've learned over the transition of being in this hip hop or just growing, you have to be able to adapt to the lessons you learn as an adolescence or as a young adult into now. You get me? And I think with going through that, it gives me a brighter aspect on trying to write raps for either the younger generation, not to the fact that I'm going to do what y'all do, but I'm going to speak to y'all of how somebody would speak to me if they was my grandfather or father. And I'm going to tell you, yeah, all that shit is this and that. But let me tell you the lesson I learned from doing the same shit 15 years ago. Okay. So... It, it, like I said, I just like making music, so fuck it. I do what I do because I got a love for it. It's not because I want to, you know, buy the newest Lamborghini or fly on a private jet or glorify the financial status of being a hip-hop rapper. I like making music. Mm. It, was, it was a talent that I could do. You get me? Trying to discover myself as a young kid. What am I going to do? You get me? And next thing you know, bingo. I started writing raps. And then the shit wasn't corny. Mm. So that's why I feel like, oh, fuck it. I can probably do this a little bit. Because 
it's one thing about me is like you gotta make sense when you make records. You get mm -hmm. me? My nigga Quick said, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. But God damn it, if you ain't making sense, it don't make sense. Because hmm. I just don't want to hear a nigga bragging about his new car and his, fucking, <laughs> and his fucking bank account and shit. Yeah, nigga, so what? You're a grown-ass man. You got to get past that. So some what? Point, right? Yep, you got a trillion. I don't. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> So what you going to do after that? Now right. you done told me all the money you got and how many cars you got and how many times you flew on the plane high and, and okay, now what? What you going to do next year? You going to tell me the same shit? Mm. Because that's when you figure out niggas don't got no substance. Facts. Mm. You get me? On this first record, I'm going to blow you up. We finna dance and party and I'm finna show you the bank account, what bitch I fucked and blah, blah, blah. And then watch the next year and they going to come with some, oh, goddamn, you got a new car? You got another check. <laughs> you got another diamond ring. <laughs> oh, fuck it. You bought you another bottle of champagne. Right. Oh, fuck. You got some new model bitches you fucking. But you see it over and over and over <laughs> that the audience gets sick of it if the artist doesn't keep evolving or, or staying true to themselves. Really. That's one thing our audience does do. They'll let you go for a minute. But when you start doing the same shit, they start going, man. Moving next, on. Yeah, next. Moving on. Yep. We've seen it so, happen a million times. Yeah. It, we, we, this young, this new generation, they like lose interest fast. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing about us is we kept longevity. Motherfuckers with substance, you will always keep longevity. Motherfuckers who just here to cash a check and just be braggadocious, you won't be known about two years from now. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. Facts. I hear that. All right, yo. MCA, it was an honor, honestly, to be able to do man, this interview. Good for having me, man. I just, I appreciate being on some shit. You get me? I'm, uh, I'm an old nigga in the house all the day. <laughs> I, I get to come out and fuck with the youngsters on the no jumper and shit. Like, like about, I told you, Karad was like, you going to see Adam? Man, fuck that. I got to go. So, shout out to no jumper, Adam, uh, my boy AD. Good luck, that, man. Yeah, happy to make a, a Compton connection here as well. Yeah, I feel like I'm yeah. doing, doing something like, right I, for the community. I, I, I want you. I want you in here with eight. I say, oh, come on, man. Oh, that's official, man. Yeah. You're official. All right. Hey, well, I appreciate it, man. I'm going to be honest with you. I got a piece so goddamn bad that it Who might explode telling? right now. Nigga, I, I ain't eight today, nigga. I, ain't I, today, the nigga. I, I just want to tell everybody the new record is coming out. It's called Lessons. I mean, we got Conway, Dave East, Talib mm. Kweli. Oh, shit. I got Havoc yeah. from Mob Deep. Mm. I got a Cocaine, Mitchie Slick. Hey, I got, a, guy. I, got, <laughs> I got Yuck Mouth. I got Corrupt. Uh, and DJ Premier, so and be real. Don't let me forget Ooh. about be real. Uh, it's a lovely project. Shout out Laura. Oh, yeah, my shout girl, out to Laura. Laura. Hey man, we can't forget Laura. She been on deck all day. Laura so it's was all in good. Cypress Hill back in the day. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So I heard. new project is lessons. It'll be your way in your minute. Thank y'all for having me. Chill. Appreciate you. MC8, No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, subscribe. NoJumper.com if you want to support. Shout out to IAD, IITSAD. Two, nigga, two eyes, Sorry, nigga. IITSAD. <laughs> oh, shout out my boy, Matt Conway. Good looking. There it is. Appreciate y'all. Yeah, you know what it do. MC8, Blue Stamp Official. Thanks for peeping out the show. You can check me out on Instagram, 808, Facebook, 8 Compton. Yeah.